sustainable product management is also just good product management, right? Don't build things nobody needs. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Green IO with Ken Dres. That's me. Green IO is the podcast for responsible technologists building a greener digital world, one byte at a time. Twice a month on a Tuesday, all guests from across the globe share insights, tools, and alternative approaches, enabling people within the tech sector and beyond to boost digital sustainability. And because accessible and transparent information is in the DNA of Green IO, all the references mentioned in this episode, as well as the transcript, will be in the show notes. You can find these notes on your favorite podcast platform and, of course, on our website, greenio.tech. Product managers have always lived in a world of contradictory injunctions. They are at the converging point of all requirements, business requirements, of course, and all the others. Let me illustrate with some sentences which might be familiar to many of you. We cannot launch feature X because I need some time to deal with my technical debt. Make sure your product is accessible and secure. We need to launch this proof of concept to test our hypothesis next week, but beware of being pixel perfect because of the risk for our brand image. Accessibility is key in our values, such as innovation, so let's don't miss the latest trend in virtual reality, etc., etc., etc. And now, after cybersecurity, accessibility, performance, etc., a new wave is coming, sustainability. With sentences like, beware of your carbon budget, How much this new feature will impact our CSRD reporting? Watch out for greenwashing with this product claims. Did you check the W3C sustainability guidelines for your product? And product managers in charge of back-end products are not off the hook. How does it perform with our API green score? Our cloud operations are too much carbon intensive. Can we delay some process to enable carbon-aware computing or even better, greed-aware computing? To be honest, I'm not that worried about the product management world succeeding eventually to overcome these new challenges. There is a great culture of adaptation to change, testing and fast learning in the product management line of work. But the main questions are how and when. Because time takes time with climate change and many sustainability tools for product managers are still missing. Hence, a question for this episode is how to become a climate active product manager today, not tomorrow. And to try answering it, I asked two hands-on experts and daily practitioners in product management to join our show today. Antonia Lendi, a former Aviv Group colleague, has become one of the top voices in European product operations. Being a community person at heart, I can testify, and loving bringing people together, she leads Germany's only meetup for product operations in Berlin, where she's based. You can find easily her work online. She has written for publications like Lead Dev, Product Lead Alliance, and Mind the Product. François Burat is a Canada-based product lead and UX consultant, mentor, and speaker with 13 years of experience working with startup and agency in North America. After taking almost a full year off following climate courses, he pivoted his career to fight the climate crisis. He now helps digital companies and product teams reduce their digital emissions via consulting, measurement, and training. In talking about training, I had the opportunity to meet him via the wonderful Climate Action Tech community when he was presenting his newly released Climate Product Management Playbook, which was well received in this community and others. So, welcome Antonia, welcome Francois, it's a pleasure to have both of you on the show. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invite, Gaia. It's my pleasure, thanks a lot for joining. To set the stage, I would like to ask a general question about the context and the momentum. Why do you believe, both of you, that product managers have a unique opportunity and responsibility right now to embrace sustainability. Maybe, Francois, you want to give the first shot? Sure. I think product managers have a unique opportunity because their role, the essence of what they do is based on influencing. So whether it's influencing their team or even beyond their team, they collaborate with all departments, you know, uh, across the organization, they tie the strategy with the execution. So they have this both 
like the way I see it visually, like a vertical and horizontal influence. And because of that, if they integrate sustainability as part of their vocabulary and par- part of their processes, then suddenly it can shine throughout the whole organization. Uh, so that's why for me, they really have a unique opportunity to uh, play a big role into making their job a climate job and their company a climate company. Yeah, I think to, to add to that, for me, PMs have a unique responsibility because well, actually everybody should have or should feel a unique responsibility, right, to make sustainability the forefront of what we do. And especially looking at the climate impact of tech, of the everyday things we use, right? How, how sustainable is this app you're actually working on? And how much could you actually meaningfully change? And if we all individually take small steps to take sustainability to the next level in our digital products, then together we can make a very big impact. So to me, that's that's exactly why we should be talking about this. Are more people talking about sustainability in product management these days than before? I mean, you both of you, you're privileged witnesses uh, in your industry. So is it still a happy fuse or do you see something a bit more general happening? Yeah, I think for me, honestly, there's still not enough out there. Um, I think there's definitely more than there was even a year ago, right? We are starting to think about sustainability in product management. We are starting to right shift left with sustainability, not do it after the fact, after a product has been created, but really as we create the product. But to me, it's still not nearly enough, honestly. Like we are scratching the surface only just barely, which is also why I was so excited to have this happen, to have this recording where we uniquely focus on what PMs can do. I 100% agree with Antonia. And uh, thank you so much, Gael, for you know cre- creating that space because we need more uh, person like you and podcasts like you to uh, raise awareness, not only on the topic of uh, digital sustainability or green IT overall, because uh, being French, I have ties in Europe, but living in Canada and North America, I can see the gap that exists between those two markets. And I usually joke, or it's not necessarily funny, but that there's maybe a three, five, seven years gap in terms of awareness between the two continents. And uh, when it comes to product management or climate positive best practices, we're even behind that. I think it started more with designers and engineers, you know, this movement. Uh, But product managers still uh, are lagging behind those two roles. Uh, and that's why uh, I, get, I got passionate about trying to do something about it. Because when I was in a position with a startup, that was borderline doing greenwashing uh, without bad intentions, right? Uh, the leveraging on the marketing um, that would come with it and the benefits that come with it. I was faced with a, a sense of um, not being able to um, properly uh, address those concerns or I was not educated and didn't have the tools to influence the company to do a better job and avoid, you know, um, implementing those practices that were not necessarily transparent, which reminded me of a, um, a company, a startup that I used to work with uh, a few years back uh, before I made my pivot uh, to work as solely on the, on the climate crisis. As a PM, I didn't have the tool uh, to properly see through the, strat- the marketing start- strategy that we had. And basically, we were uh, making claims that we were an environmentally friendly company or aiming for, towards net zero and so on and so forth, but purely basing on uh, the whole strategy on offsets, on carbon offsets, without any other um, uh, actions or um, awareness of what it meant to be net zero or try to fight climate change. And we were making those big claims to our users that, you know, uh, if they were using our app, uh, they would, you know, uh, do a good gesture for the environment. And I always knew that the bullshit matter was super high. Unfortunately, I didn't have the tool to properly uh, educate people or push back against it. Uh, so it ended up being, you know, uh, part of the strategy and released and everyone was leveraging it in our social network and so on. And um, and that's also why I felt this frustration, this not necessarily anger, but this desire to uh, start educating myself and 
And with that, try to spread the message and raise the awareness for my peers. It reminds me a very personal story of a guy who had a very significant over several hundred millions uh, budget in a big company as a CTO or a group CTO, you name it the way you want, and didn't do that much because he just thought that it was all about asking AWS to be greener. I must admit this guy was me. And yet, Francois, it's interesting what you've described because it's really uh, what, you know, Ariane Kingaby in a previous episode on greenwashing, she, she referred to it as unintentional greenwashing, like greenwashing with best intention. It's just that you, you don't like, you don't have a, like a master plan and with people with dark uh, hoodies saying, ah, ha, ha, we're going to screw our customers. No, it's just you believe this is the right stuff to do because you don't have the information and the basic information regarding offsetting is, sorry, dude, but the civil aviation took all the available land on Earth to plant trees to offset their only activities, and there is no room left for any others. So that's just the basic um, issue with offsetting, but I still love this example. <laughs> and I mean, anyway. against uh, planting trees, right? But then yeah, the yeah, big, uh, it, no, it's ask, super like, important. Cool. Yeah, it's super important to plant tree for sure. <laughs> but it's, it don't, doesn't offset anything. It's just that it will help us rebuild the carbon sink that uh, we, we've... Uh, yeah, that we need so badly. And what about you, Antonia? Yeah, I mean, just listening to you, Francois, like I, I worked at a sustainability startup for a little while. Like our, our whole thing is it was a reusable shipping box, right? That you could reuse hundreds and hundreds of times. It had some smart trackers and everything. Obviously, there was an app, right? So even though our core mission was sustainability, was recycling, was enabling the circular economy, right? By, I don't know, packing your old clothes in the box or dropping it off at the center, having a community around all that. It stopped at that product, right? Even back then, we weren't savvy enough to think about where is our data hosted? How much of this data do we actually need to host, right? How many iOS versions or Android versions are we supporting, right? Things that nowadays, after my own research, after sort of embedding myself more into these topics, seem almost like common sense to me. But even in such a climate active, I suppose, environment, we weren't even thinking about that because tech was always only seen as an enabler and not as one of the root causes, right? I think there, there's something that I, I observe over, over, the, uh, over the years, which is that people, like especially climate tech or sustainable companies, because their whole mission is to uh, uh, um, deliver like impact, you know, based on their mission, uh, they forget that uh, the why is not allow, aligned with the how they do it. And they could implement the worst practice uh, in terms of like digital, right? Uh, and yet target it, like, a, like claim, you know, that they're doing good thing for the world. But like, it's kind of like this, um, this uh, duality that is not well understood. And what I could observe is that the, the, the reason why the company is created and uh, the how, which is how they build their software from a digital standpoint, uh, because they implement the worst practices, at the end of the day, backlash the whole reason why they were created in the first place, which is something that obviously no one is perfect, right? So the, in, the intention is to try to do good in all areas in the company, and there's parts that would be more advanced than others, but it's important, and that's why today is important, to raise awareness about like how you can build software and digital products, because that could impact, uh, have a great impact. And uh, you need to be aware of it to uh, lessen, uh, you know, the, the negative impact that you can have while building and maintaining uh, what is created to solve a, this, you know, a valuable problem in the society. I think it's very valuable uh, feedback that you share about this discrepancy between what we want to achieve, what we are truly doing, etc. But both of you, you are daily practitioners, so let's get our hands dirty. How can we become a climate active uh, product manager today? And what is sustainable product management? I think for me, sustainable product management is really 
so I, I have this, like, it's a super basic definition of what product management is, right? It's delivering value to the user in a way that benefits our business. And to me, sustainable product management is in a way that benefits our business and our planet, right? I think ultimately sustainable product management starts from the moment you are identifying problems and scoping solutions, but it can run the whole gamut of, and this is something that people will not want to hear, right? But how much data are we storing and how much of that data are we actually looking at? And then, I mean, I addressed this beforehand, right? Like the implications of our product choices. How many mobile phone versions are we going to support with our app, right? And it becomes more and more narrow every single year. And the consequence of that is that we are excluding ourselves from people who want to have older and perfectly working phones. Right. I think there are just many small knock on effects that we just need to play through in our minds. We just need to think through the ramifications of small choices like that. Yeah, I love it. Um, I think, as you said, like it's, it's we need to, as PM, uh, consider the environment and sustainability as a other. We used to think about the triptych, you know, technology, uh, design or user and business. Right. And for me, like we, we can see sustainability as a, a force pillar, or we can see it another way, which is kind of an under, an underlying conditions that if you apply those best practices, will create a better experience, will create a better technology because leaner, faster, but also will drive better business results. So I kind of see this triangle, like 3D shapes in my head right now, which may not make sense. <laughs> but I think it's it, we can really see it uh, as something that will make your whole business and product better. But I think what is missing that we were referring to earlier is that because the awareness is, miss, is, is lacking on the topic, we don't know the impact that we have. And if we start to line things together from an energy standpoint, carbon emission, water consumption, and so on, then suddenly we would have other lens to see the problem and other tools or reinforce the desire to implement the tools and the best practices that we all know that are good to implement, right? So for me, that's, that's where there is a huge opportunity for PM. Can you indulge us uh, a structured way to deep dive? Uh, what are the, the, the big bunks of stuff or actions or tasks that you would advise, you know, as an overview to pay attention to when you're a product manager? Because Antonia mentioned the data. She, and that's very rare in our industry, mentioned the hardware and making sure that we are not part of the planned or even not planned, but just technical obsolescence problem that our industry is rigged by. So, wow, big kudo for that. <laughs> but, and, and Francois, how would you would structure a bit everything? Because this is exactly what you've done in your playbook. To double down on what Antonia said, like the whole manufacturing, hardware, distribution, end of life, and so on and so forth, that represents about two thirds of em emissions of the digital industry, right? So we cannot state enough in this podcast and in our lifetime how big our impact, uh, how, how big digital is physical. So to answer your question, Gael, um, in the with a playbook that we co um, we co wrote with Antoine Cabot with a friend of mine working in Salesforce, at Salesforce in, uh, in BC, Canada. We structure it around five chapters, but maybe we can focus on some of them for the sake of the discussion. The first one is to, as a PM, embed climate or sustainability as part of your rituals. And you know, it's, all, it's all about you know, how you choose the right metrics, how you track your digital footprint, how you include your, the planet uh, into your product requirements, documents, your briefs, and so on and so forth. So that's the first chapter. Uh, the second chapter is how you build in a more mindful way. So thinking about the planet as a persona, you know, animals as a persona, how you uh, try to tie your strategy to um, sustainability, um, sustainable development goals, and so on and so forth, and how you avoid, you know, as we said, like obsolescence tactic, tactics and how you can leverage AI in a sustainable way. Because as much you know, as we want to make uh, sustainability 
uh, a trend for PMs. Right now, AI is like leading the race by far. So we have to see what we can, you know, use from their, you know, the, the, this momentum that they have to, to do the same for sustainable topics for PMs. So anyway, that was the second chapter. The third chapter is like how to apply frugal, uh, minimalist best practices. So uh, coming back to what Antonia was saying, like how you minimize the amount of data that is being transferred, stored, how you simplify and build straightforward uh, user journey that avoid all the fluff, you know, remove, remove product bloat, you remove features that are not used, you remove data that are not used, you remove scripts and, and components and so on and so forth. Uh, and don't forget to kill features, you know. Uh, the fourth um, chapter is about, you know, how to be more uh, carbon aware and or grid aware, but just as a concept that not only we should uh, make sure that we consume the least amount of energy, but also the, the low carbon energy as much as possible. And we migrate, you know, your server uh, or your hosting provider to, to choose a, a sustainable one and things like that. And the fifth pillar, and I'm going to stop here because it, it, there's so many things that we can talk about, about each of those topics, is to leverage your influence. As we said earlier, we have a huge influence internally. We have a huge influence in our ecosystem, in our value chain, the way we choose our partner, you know, whether uh, it's to transport our, for e-commerce website, let's say, you know, uh, who are we partnering to deliver our product? Are we choosing a, part, a, a provider with a sustainable practices or who use electric vehicles or like bikes even for delivery? So like all of that is kind of how we can use our influence internally and externally. And I think this is a power that usually we have, but don't, we don't realize that we have it. And there's a big miss opportunity if we don't you know, leverage it to the full extent. So those are the five chapters. And thanks a lot for structuring it, because now I'd like to play a little game with both of you, which is for each chapter and pick one example that you would like to see widely adopted for uh, each of these uh, chapter. And of course, feel free to pick uh, the chapters in, in whatever order you want. And Antonia, I might bet some money on which chapter will come first, but... <laughs> please feel free to start <laughs> i mean honestly there were so many things that resonated with me as you were talking but i think first and foremost and this is something that i stress over and over again right sustainable product management is also just good product management right don't build things nobody needs right get rid of that bloat i love that you mentioned minimalism but i think like to me this really comes in two different forms one of them is really actually how we structure the user experience of our products. Like Netflix, if you let it, it will just keep playing. Like YouTube will just keep streaming. Same, same with Spotify, right? They are built to keep streaming high quality, expensive data, right? Because that's how they make their money. But that has a massive, massive climate impact. I really love, uh, Antonia, the idea that let the user choose and especially when you look at all these experience with, as you, as you mentioned, Netflix, YouTube, etc., cetera, um, in their values, most of them is like, do, do no harm, provide the best possible experience. When, when you say that one of the worst health crises that the world is actually under, and it's completely under the radar, is a sleep crisis, that we are literally destroying our health because we're so much stimulated that we don't, sleep enough in almost every country uh, compared to the minimum requirement of our body, uh, you could seriously challenge uh, if it's that much sustainable uh, offering people nonstop video, nonstop audio, at least without a message and some kind of action that say, hey, by the way, you've just spent three hours. It's uh, 2 a.m. in the morning. Most of the people will go to bed at that time. Do you still want to? Like, like a bit like on the cigarette packet. But what was it your idea, Antonia? So first of all, this broadens also the scope of sustainability, right? Is, is mental well-being part of sustainability as well? I'd like to think that's a part of it as well. Um, but the second one, like now you're, you're going into the... So I, I have made exactly this case of the climate impact of watching Netflix on your phone. Like you, you download an episode, you're on a flight, whatever, watching Netflix on your phone. Um, and two things usually happen, right? People are shocked 
at the impact of something so small and so mundane. And then people despair, right? Because it's like, well, shit, I do this all day, every day. If we're in Zoom calls, we're streaming data to each other just the whole entire time, right? What is the impact of that? But I think it's also realizing that, yes, you might be contributing to the problem, right? Currently, and yes, there is this initial shock you have to go through to understand just how big the impact of our everyday actions with tech are. But all of this information, all of this, like all of us talking about this isn't to make you feel bad about your daily habits. It's just to allow you to be more conscious in the future, to have that maybe sense of responsibility, to have that just extra second where you think, well, hang on, do we really need this, right? Can we give users an option? So enable the user to pose and give them an option. I think it's a, it's a beautiful statement. François, do you want to go for the second round? What would be a very actionable uh, idea or best practices uh, you'd like to share? And where does it refer to in your framework, in your five chapters uh, framework? Yeah, I, I actually wanted to, um, to, uh, to react to what you were saying because it was so interesting. I think like uh, Gael, you were referring to Netflix and, you know, this, the, the, the need, you know, to sleep. But I think it was a uh, Netflix CEO that actually said that they were, they were, the, their biggest competitor is, is sleep, right? So I think it shows how uh, problematic it is and how, um, you know, we can talk about sustainability and responsibility, but we do, we do have an impact in many different ways and that we, we need to embody that uh, in, a, in a more responsible way. And coming back to the Netflix example again about autoplay, which is an environmental disaster and not only because of the example we just talked about, there's two practical ways you can fight against it. And I saw it with a client that I'm working with at the moment for the past few months. They have they are a media platform. And uh, basically, there's two ways you can approach it. Either you ban autoplay or you avoid it as much as possible, which is not necessarily the, uh, the most acceptable way. But another way to look at it, and by no means it's perfect, right, is to instead of like launching the video, the autoplay after three seconds, where the user basically don't have a choice because it goes so fast that it just happened, right? Maybe can you extend it by five seconds or 10 seconds, 15 seconds? So at least you give the user the control, the power to reflect on that. And maybe there is a chance also to educate the user. Hey, is it time to sleep? Or hey, do you know that, you know, like the, 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 that the environmental toll that, that you know, streaming has. So the intention here is not to blame users and put the responsibility on them. It's us as digital creator and builders that needs to uh, build by default something that is green, right, or sustainable. But there's so many ways that when you start understanding the problems and become an expert of the problem, and that's all about being a PM, right? You have to become expert of the problem because before you become expert of the solution. So when you add sustainability into your framework, then suddenly you can have new creative solutions to uh, embed into your product. And that's what I find fascinating. It's not like a, something more that you have to, to add to your day that is kind of bothering you and you have to make it fit. It's something that can unlock new possibilities uh, and make your product better. If I'm allowed to bounce back on what you say, Francois, you use the word framework. And I recall an entire chapter is dedicated to culture, rituals, etc. And I know for you and Antonia how pivotal this culture question is. Starting with you, Francois, what would be a good idea, a good practices to entrench the sustainability mindset in product management? There's different way you can surface climate into your your product. Uh, and we can start with OKRs. Uh, I think we were talking about OKRs before the, the show started. You, you can take those as opportunities, right? Either you have a company that is mature enough that you can have sustainable uh, or climate-related OKRs, like we want to reduce our footprint by 10% by the end of the year, and then you break it down and you kind of see how you can reach that goal. Or you have non-climate OKRs, let's say, you know, in increase revenue or reduce cost. But when you talk about that, like when you break it down, reduce costs, like probably like if you're a big tech company, cloud expenditure, 
probably a big, you know, um, a, a big center cost, right? Uh, cost center, sorry. And why why is that? Because you you store a lot of data, and oh, okay, so how can we reduce that data stored and and see how we can be more intentional in the way we store what we need and what we and and, and not store what we don't need. Uh, and then suddenly, like you become like more aware of the life cycle of uh, of data, and then you can remove uh, things that are not needed because, as Antonia said earlier, like you don't need all the information about user that churned five years ago about what they did on a specific day, right? And so when you become a bit more in- intentional and minimalist and like more specific about you know why are we storing this and why are we building this and why do we keep this feature that serves no one, suddenly like. You will trim down your product, make it lighter, make it, make it faster, remove the fluff, trim images, compress, and so on and so forth. And then, oh, well, we just reduce the cost of our you know, cloud uh, infrastructure by 5, 10, 20%. And oh, that feeds this OKR that is about you know, the bottom line. And we didn't talk about sustainability, right? We just did what, is, what makes sense. But at the end of the day, we have a climate impact. So I think either you lead a conversation with you know, environmental topic, or you just find the opportunities within existing strategy, given that most of, uh, I don't want to overgeneralize, but most of sustainable and climate best practices for PM or for digital folks out there is good for the business and the product. Uh, and there's other ways you can do it, but you can set carbon budget when you release a new feature to make sure that you track this, uh, you track uh, and you and make assumption and projection about how much a, a, um, a feature could um, you know could weigh in, in terms of carbon, and when it's released, like making sure that it doesn't exceed a certain amount of, of carbon emitted, so you stay within um, a, a range of, of um, an, an, an acceptable amount of carbon emitted. You can look at page weight. There's a uh, page weight budget as well. There's tools out there that can help you to build pages that are not exceeding you know uh, let's say two meg or three meg uh, per, per per page. And that's a way that you can embed, you know, the discussion with your folks, like define like definition of done and acceptance criteria with the designers and developers and start to make them part of the discussion and challenge them with them with this. And that should be something that excites them as well. Yeah, I think for my side to add to that, like if honestly, if you're really serious about this, make it a prioritization metric, just like everything else, right? You we talk about complexity. We talk about the size of the problem space. We talk about the projected ARR, right? If you've identified a really exciting new feature that might make you a million in ARR, why it's terrible for the planet, are you still committing to doing that, right? And I think it is, we do have to retain a certain pragmatic approach in that everything's a trade-off, right? Some things you might identify as an organization we do not want to compromise on the specific part of the user experience, but we're going to do our best to do everything else everywhere else, right? Like it is, right? It's not about despairing. It's not about, oh shit, we're doing everything wrong. It's really just about educating yourself, understanding your trade-offs and then making them a reality, right? Like embedding them in the product management process, right? This is the feature we've planned. This is how it's going to positively or negatively affect our climate bottom line. We mentioned OKR. We mentioned how it needs to be ritualized in definition of dawn, et cetera, et cetera. I have a low ball for you because I'm actually, I'm still struggling with this one. And, and don't get me wrong, it's already super hard to get a key results around carbon budget, page weight, uh, carbon footprint, you name it, whatever. But we know that if you're a front end, I would say, a product manager, and I'm struggling to find a proper key result that could be connected to an overall sustainability objective about how we make sure that we do not contribute to technical obsolescence. I mean, I think the perfect one is going to be difficult, but off the top of my head, um, I would probably more likely look at the percentage of people included or excluded if you move up, let's say, an iOS version or if you move up a certain OS requirement. 
And then, and then it becomes about inclusivity as well, right? It's not, it, it becomes about, well, how many people on the planet can use your product? And at that point, I don't know why people aren't thinking about this more, right? Like I used to work at, at a startup here in Berlin that, that had a fitness app and they purposefully wanted to exclude older versions because that, it was like a more premium thing now. Our, our, our app is only for people with new phones, right? But I think I would I would rather think about the percentage, right? Set a target percentage for this amount of people on the planet can use our app, um, rather than set specific targets for yeah specific versions, for example. Yeah, we tend to agree. I think uh, we can look at version being like, oh, I cover the five latest version of this OS and and maybe I could go to five or like six or seven or eight, ten, right? Or we can just be a bit more diligent and thoughtful about, okay, who are our, who are our users? Like, how do they, are they distributed among, you know, OS and versions and so on and so forth? And then, then with this kind of idea, like percentage in mind and distribution in mind, then we can, if we are like um, delivering a good experience, and we have, we can, you know, be more specific about defining good for each company. But if we only cover a deliver a good experience for like ninety uh, percent of our users, how can we make sure that the ten percent others are also, you know, even if they run on old OS or equipment, then they can have the best version of the the, the, the app. And and if they can, because the the the, the device itself cannot support the you know the most flashy features that you offer to the latest iphone then how you you uh, um, degrade or adapt rather uh, the the experience so that they can do everything that they need to do but maybe in a more uh, streamlined and minimalist way again and i would go even beyond than that maybe uh, in the sense that by uh, designing uh, our software we exclude people from the get-go so how can we go even by making our app uh, or product even more accessible, we can increase our target market, right? Because suddenly, if let's say we support uh, a bank application, support transaction by SMS or by text messages, right? How much more we can unlock, you know, new customer and acquire a new uh, target audience, right? So I think we also have to see the opportunities and not just uh, be constrained by existing users. Let's think about non-users as well. I'm very relieved, François, because I was afraid I was once again about to, to make a lecture on the survival bias and the fact that countlessly people were telling me, this is our audience, this is what we should focus on. And I was always like, you know, the survival bias, the plane, blah, 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 World War II. Anyway, is there any one last darling best practices that you'd love to share, whether it's about culture, whether it's about onboarding your CEO, um, you name it? I mean, for me, like, again, like it's this ecosystem thinking, right? Like it's not just the digital products we build, it's how we build them. And like, this is such a stupid example, but do you have oat milk or do you have almond milk in your office, right? Like it takes a huge amount of water to produce an almond, which you then squeeze desperately trying to get something akin to milk for your vegan and lactose intolerant friends right? What do you have reusable cups? Or do you have mugs? Is it where does the recycling go? Like even 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 at this workshop, um, I was giving a talk on sustainability, and there was nowhere to recycle my paper cup. And I, like, that was awful to me. And it's just these little details that make up the entire environment of how we produce digital products that matters. Yeah, absolutely. Um, as for me, I think, uh, as we state, stated at the beginning of, the, of this talk, um, we have an issue right now that this is still the best kept secret, right? Like the impact of, the, of digital product on the, sustainability, on, the, on the environment and the planet. So let's get people talking. Let's, there's plenty of, of people that cares about this topic, like and the more you dive in, the more expert you, you discover, discover. And there's expert on sustainability uh, everywhere around the world. So please invite some local folks to do talks at your company, do workshop about the environment. Like there's the digital collage 
that probably have um, have a folks uh, around you that that can you know come and speak about the the, the, the interconnection between climate and and, and sustainable product uh, digital products sorry so like really start making this top this topic more broadly uh, talked about and maybe one thing that I really want to put a focus on by making your product uh, emitting less emissions by using the least amount of energy, you will get a product that will be faster, that would perform better. If you have an e-commerce platform, it would convert better as well because the the, the experience would be so smooth regardless of the design, the, the, the device and the user satisfaction would be higher, so the retention would be higher. And so suddenly, like with those product benefits that we're kind of starting to line up together, then they materialize into business benefits because, you know, your product would be differentiated. You would increase your margin. You will increase revenue. You would acquire more user, as we just said before. And considering the newest generation, you know, like the, the Gen Z and so on and so forth, they were raised and they are being raised with eco-anxiety, you know. So if your brand doesn't care about climate or is using leveraging greenwashing tactics, it's likely that they probably, some of them at least, would not like to work for you. So from a talent attraction and retention standpoint, as well as customer attraction and retention, like climate needs to be part of your strategy. Like all uh, job is a climate job and all company is a climate company because you don't live in a bubble. You live on a... We live on in the same earth, right? So that's really something that I would love people to understand. We're not just like uh, pure environmentalists, you know, uh, eating grass and feeding ourselves with sun, right? There is ways that you can have the right value and serve your career, serve your business, serve your product and your users better. One last question before we close the podcast. So we talked a lot about tactics at product management levels, uh, we talked about OKR, we talked about carbon budget, we talked about um, using some key results, the weight, uh, making sure that you know you can use your apps or your products on, on multiple equipment and platforms. There is still something that I believe is related, Francois, to what you said about uh, leverage your influence because product manager tends to have quite a lot of influence within the company. And it's how do you pitch your boss? How do you pitch your CEO? And, you know, you've stated, both of you, that the momentum, the sustainability momentum is getting traction, but it's not that big yet. And let's be honest, it's usually not among top business people that it's the biggest. And so how do you pitch your boss? And do we always have this fight or this competition between sustainability and business? And here... I would like to set apart unsustainable business model. And obviously, if you're drilling for more oil and that you have no transition plan and that you want in 2100 uh, to do exactly the same business, you can build the cleanest possible uh, digital products, uh, <laughs> IT stack, etc. You've got a bigger issue than just this very specific part of your activity. But for, I would say, regular uh, economic activities, is it that much tension between sustainability or business? I mean, I think I'd go back to what Francois just said, right? Like, it, it's actually just good business practice. You don't have to lead with sustainability. Lead with lower costs, right? Client computing especially. Like, that is always a huge bill. Lead with improved UX, right? Lead with more people can use our product. And then... By the way, this also means that we are lowering our footprint. By the way, this also means that we are now more mindful of what we store and how much we store and where we store it. And I've had to do this a lot, right? Doing like trying to get traction for, for mission important things under the guise of something else. But it's really just learning to speak the language that will resonate the most with your CEO, with your CTO right? Getting that buy-in. And you can do it on such a small scale. You can do it for one feature, right? You can do it for, I don't know, the, the next AWS migration, because it's going to come sooner or later. I think almost using these valid business benefits as a Trojan horse to get people into the habit of thinking this way. And then honestly, before you know it, it is part of your culture. Antonia said it perfectly. I don't know what I can add to it, but choose the right metrics that can resonate with them. Because like, as we know, like it, 
like sustainable uh, product um, best practices can really fit into many areas and avoid moralizing. Like no one wants to be on the wrong side of, a, of an argument and create FOMO. There's so many examples that we didn't share today, but you know, like big companies and smaller ones that are doing great thing in that, in that area. So look at what's happening around them and create FOMO because maybe your competitor is actually starting to implement those practices and suddenly like people will start to freak out because they're like, okay, they're doing it, so we should do it. And also waved a bit of the flag of um, like some climate risk that comes with it. There's a lot of regulation in Europe. There's not that many in North America and we need those to come like GDPR, right? It just came in a wave and suddenly everyone has to, to adapt to it. And so there's also that part of the equation that maybe would resonate better with some people. And we don't want just to be negative doom and gloom, but you know, you need the two approach, like benefits, opportunities, and risks to be part of the discussion. So I think like we, we have many tools basically to, to be able to convey that point. And, make, and as you said, Antonia, uh, if sustainability isn't even part of the discussion, you know, be my guest, that that's also perfectly fine. So thanks, Francois, because there were a lot of tips. Uh, fear of missing out is pretty cool. Climate risk and fear of regulation is pretty cool as well. I think finding the right allies is so true. I mean, it really depends uh, in some companies that's so true that your CFO will be your best friend or the ESG director will be or sustainability director will be uh, your best friend. So that, that's a very good uh, point. My last question before asking the traditional closing uh, question will be, do you need that much the permission to become a climate active product manager if, if i may start on this one antonia uh it's kind of interesting because i'm giving a, a training at the moment and the two assignments that i give to uh my fellows are one looking at the playbook and the 33 best practices in the playbook and looking at the ones they can implement without permission and the one they can implement and sometimes it's either or you know they maybe they can influence both implement and influence and sometimes they can only want do one of them um, so absolutely, there's so many things that you can do that are just part of your job and you don't need, you know, the approval of anyone. And the second assignment that I give to them is how to pitch them internally, which, which is what we just talked about and basically helping them to create a slide deck to pitch this topic internally and see how we can be tied to the strategy of the company. So, um, so yeah, uh, it's, it's just so on point. <laughs> So you can say to your students, no need to use chat GPT, just listen to the latest Green IO episode and you'll you'll get a good grade. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and what about you, Antonia? Yeah, I mean, I'm all for asking for forgiveness rather than asking for permission, right? I'm, even in product management, like there's so many of us that wouldn't be able to get to do the things we really want to do, like God forbid, actually speak to some customers, right? You you just you just need to find different ways of doing it. And like I say, like use a Trojan horse if you need to go find alternate ways to to get your job done without having to ask. And like don't even let anyone know, right? Like once once you have a strong enough case, that's when you can go talk about it. That's when you can go and say that, by the way. I've actually been doing this for the last month and it hasn't disrupted anything. So why don't we do this for all teams, right? I'm a huge, huge fan of this approach. Thanks a lot. I love this approach as well. I'd like to ask you the final closing question, which is, would you share a positive piece of news regarding sustainability, maybe even sustainably in the IT sector? Actually, for me, the positive news is that this podcast is happening, that we're having this conversation that I now got to know a whole other person who is so passionate about this topic. And I think this is the biggest marker of future success for me, because I think the more people talk about this, the more people with a meaningful voice talk about this and share really specific, actionable, real world strategies the sooner we can get to a place where this is no longer a niche subject. Great. I'm going to have a mainstream podcast now. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I, I, I wish, uh, I, I, that's all I wish for, for your podcast. Uh, I, I think I would, my, my positive news will be in the, in the, going in the same sense of what Antonia just said. I think um, two years back, uh, because I made my pivot like not long ago in all respect, you know, like it was two, three years ago. 
uh, when I talked about it, I was the only one. Like, especially if, if I talk about my context in Montreal, Canada, or North America, like, like when I talk about climate and, 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 and products, people were just looking at me like, what, what are you talking about? Uh, but now, like, people reach out to me so that I talk about this topic. And it's only my personal story, right? But I see that the momentum is shifting in North America. Like, there's more lights shine on, shine on, on this topic. And before I had to push the topic everywhere so that maybe someone will pick up on it and talk about, agree to talk uh, to me about it. Now people reach out to me to talk about this topic. And I'm, I, would, I would hope and I would assume that it's the same thing for many other person in that ecosystem, which I think it just shows and demonstrates that there, there, there is a momentum happening and, and that the awareness is slowly picking up. And hopefully with the awareness, people will start you know, taking action, which is at the end of the day what we, what we need. Because the, uh, to come back to your introduction, Gail, like we need to uh, start acting now and not tomorrow. Thanks. That's great to see this momentum indeed. Um, it was really cool to have you on the show today. There's very practical insights. I mean, I guess there are a lot of concerns to be ex extracted by anyone working in the product management field. So I would say mission accomplished. Congratulations to both of you and looking forward to uh, continue our discussion offline. It was lovely being here. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Gael, and great to meet you, Antonia. I think we have many more discussions to have together. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you for listening to this Green IO episode. If you enjoyed it, share it and give us five stars on Apple or Spotify. We are an independent media relying solely on you to get more listeners. Plus, it will give our little team, Jill, Mabel, Tani, and I, a nice booster. In our next episode, we will cover the publishing event of this semester in Green IT, the release of the new O'Reilly book Building Green Software, with one of its co-author, Sarah Bergman. Green IO is a podcast and much more, so visit greenio.tech to subscribe to our free monthly newsletter, read the latest articles on our blog, and check the conferences we organize across the globe. The next one is in London on September 19th, and you can get a free ticket using the Vucha Green IO VIP. Lucky you. Feel also free to apply as a speaker if you are a fellow responsible technologist with insights on how to build a greener digital world. One bite at a time.